Now, okay, so what you're, you're sitting there going right now, well, what the hell's WeWork? If you haven't heard about WeWork, WeWork is simply a company like Regis. Um, Regis is a national company. They go into a commercial office building. They lease up a floor of the building. They make a bunch of offices out of it with shared conference rooms, a shared kitchen, shared copier room, those type of things. And so you go in, you rent an office, the receptionist answers the phone for, for you and they patch you through. And, and for all intents and purposes, somebody calling you, calling your, your personal business, it looks like you have your own office, right? You have your own office, your own secretary, um, your own mail collection center, your own address, you have a suite number, you look legit, right? So you're just this independent kind of guy trying to start a business in these kind of these communal offices. Work away very well for that. Regis has been a, a very successful company at doing this. They make money at it. Not a lot, but they make money. They are they actually are profitable. Well, that's all we work is. We work didn't innovate anything new. They didn't take the shared office space idea and put it all on an app and you know disrupt the whole situation no they're they're simply another regis they're just a big competitor to regis the only thing they did differently was they just made it all kind of techy nothing special but they took in billions upon billions of dollars to to basically lease office space and to go rent that office space out to other people but they lose a tremendous amount of money doing this. They approach their business model from an aspect of kind of a blitzkrieg, right? We're gonna take massive quantities of capital. We're gonna go lease billions and billions of dollars of commercial real estate, and hopefully we'll fill it all up and eventually we'll make some money. The problem is, is that the cost of doing their business was substantially higher than what they can generate in the revenue from the, the leases that they give out. So they wind up burning capital every year. The author of the article from the Wall Street Journal says, Capitalism has lifted millions out of poverty in China. The dark side is it's creating wealth inequality. This is the big political football of the Democrats right now is that capitalism sucks because it creates wealth inequality. But let's break down the statement that he actually made. Millions of people lifted out of poverty due to capitalism. That's a good thing. When you have capitalism, it creates wealth inequality because there are those that participate in the capitalistic system and they take advantage of the capitalistic system and they lift themselves out of poverty and then there's everybody else that doesn't. So yes, capitalism does create inequality in systems. But here's the important point. Capitalism lifts millions of people out of poverty, which means that everybody was equal before because they were all poor. Socialism and communism don't create economic prosperity. And yes, socialism and communism have massive quantities of wealth and equality because in a socialistic communistic system, those at the top, <laughs> you know, in the government, those at the top echelons of the communistic socialist system have all the wealth. Everybody else is poor. So Mike's had a new article out. Uh, him and, and Jack Scott have an article out to, today talking about QE by any other name. What are you seeing here? We expect that over the coming month or two, and it takes a while to hit these numbers, that we will see some deterioration in the jobs reports. And the question is, how does that spill over into the behavior of the consumer? Mm -hmm. And that's the million dollar question because the consumer is 70% of GDP growth. Right, well, again, if they start losing their job, then that becomes problematic, right? The ISM reports came up for Europe and it dropped sharply from 51.9 to 50.1. So they're on the cusp of a contraction in the services industry, which pretty much means Europe is in recession. Yeah, we were talking about this just for the break is that you go from, you know, 55 to 54 to 52, 51, and then you get to 49.9 and all of a sudden we're in contraction. Uh, you know, right. we've been contracting for months now and a slowing rate of growth is also contraction. The Federal Reserve's cut rates twice this year um, so far. And you know, there's a lot of pressure from the White House for the Fed to cut rates more. Um, lots of talk about you know QE, and of course, this is where the Fed is into the market, supplying liquidity. There's two ways to think about that, Lance. They were in this game prior to 2008. The Fed always did this. They would inject liquidity. Sometimes they would do overnight, sometimes one week, two week. So QE is vastly different than what they were doing. Two ex-Fed officials basically argued the Fed needs to do a permanent liquidity injection, but they never called it really QE 
which is interesting. So the question is, is it QE or is it what they were doing before the financial crisis? You know, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must be a, a duck. and I'll leave it, I'll leave it to the listener to figure out what it is. There's a real probability, whether or not Trump gets elected in the next presidential election in 2020, there is going to be a change to tax law within either one year or within five years. So if he gets elected, then it'll maybe push it out for another four years. But whoever gets elected next is likely gonna be a Democrat. Why do I say that? Because that's the way it works historically. If you go back in history, we don't have a run of Republican presidents for like 40 years, right? You generally have one or two cycles of a Republican president, then you have a Democrat, and then it goes back and forth. And it's just, this is the way it's always been. The issue is, is that we are going to change into a Democratic president at some point. Look at the platforms, and I've told you this before, fiscal conservatism and Republican conservatism is dead. It's gone. It's never coming back. And I will tell you something else. Capitalism is dead. It's gone. It's not ever coming back because the next cycle of people that are coming up to run the government are the ones that you're hearing about on television and in the news and you know the ones that are, are out on campuses protesting capitalism and wanting socialism. This is your next crop of leaders. These are your next crop of business leaders. These are your next crop of senators and congressmen, and this is your next president that's coming. The economy that we have known over the last 50, 60, 70 years is gone. It's not coming back. And the fact that we're running a trillion dollar deficit is telling you that this is going to be a long term issue. Slow economic growth, the changes towards a socialistic type economy where we have the government paying for more and taxpayers paying much more in taxes. It's all coming. Whether it starts with a wealth tax or not, one tax is going to go up for sure is the estate tax. Why? Because it's an easy tax to go after because it only hits rich people. So that way it'll be promoted. The lower the limit for your exclusion to $500,000 or a million dollars again, where it was previously, they'll increase the tax rate on state taxes. Death taxes are easy to go after. It doesn't tick a lot of people off at the polls. Going after a wealth tax, easy to do. But ultimately, taxes for you are going up. Your income taxes are going to go up the more socialistic the economy gets because somebody's got to pay the tab.